I know most of you um, certainly are probably very familiar with Dr. Kushner's work. Um, he's certainly prolific in our field of pediatric ophthalmology. I'll just give you a few kind of highlights of, of things that, um, that he has done. So um, Dr. Kushner did his ophthalmology residency at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, followed by a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, Florida. He then returned to the University of Wisconsin where he's been a faculty member since 1974 and has served as the director of the Pediatric Eye and Adult Strabismus Clinic. He is currently Professor Emeritus in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Dr. Kushner has been the secretary for APOS and he has served as editor-in-chief for the Journal of Pediatric Ophthalmology, founding editor of the Journal of APOS, and the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Binocular Vision and Ocular Motility. Dr. Kushner has published over 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts, authored 41 textbook chapters, edited three textbooks, and was the sole author of another two textbooks. The vast majority of these publications have dealt with strabismus and disorders of binocular vision. Dr. Kushner has given 24, perhaps now 25, named lectures, and has received many awards, including the Heed Award, the Bressler Prize, and the Senior Honor Award from both the AAO and APOS. He has been listed in every annual edition of Best Physicians in America since its first publication in 1993, and was named one of the 20 most innovative pediatric surgeons alive by the organization Top Masters in Healthcare Administration. So, there is what I missed in my original <laughs> welcome comments. So um, on to the next item in our agenda. If everybody's okay to move on, we've got up next, what I have learned in 45 years of studying intermittent exotropia. So if we're ready for that one, Dr. Kushner, I will let you take okay. it away. Let me get the screen share up and we'll be ready to go. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Katie, for that very, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, this is a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, as you'll hear the lecture evolve, uh, it's been uh, quite a long um, journey, I'll say. It's a 45-year journey, and uh, when I think of it as a journey, I'm uh, Reminded of the words from the Divine Comedy, Dante say, therefore, for your sake, follow me, I will be your guide. And then I thought, you know, I'm talking about intermittent exotropia, and maybe Karen Russell's words uh, might be more appropriate. Uh, no one can ever get to hell without assistance, uh, so uh, I'm going to guide you in there. History of the journey. This started, I, I was actually a first-year resident. 1970. And I learned Burian's classic uh, classification of intermittent extropia, dated back to the 1950s. And as you know, he, he categorized them as a divergence excess, the deviations bigger at distance. In, in all of these categories, 10 prism diopters was the cutoff point between saying it was the same or, or bigger. A basic, for lack of a better term, a deviation is the same at distance um, and near. Uh, convergence insufficiency, bigger at near than distance. And then, and then he used the term, it, it, the literature back then, some call it simulated divergence excess, some pseudo divergence excess, I hear both. But that's the patient that looks like a divergence excess, but they're really masking a bigger deviation at near due to either um, fusional convergence, accommodative convergence, whatever, and special testing brings out this bigger deviation and call that a pseudo divergence excess. And according to Burian, the classification determined the treatment for reasons uh, which seemed obvious, but in a way may not make sense. And, and subsequent, I think from the 1950s on, this classification was concretized. It was, it was set in stone. And I, reading this literature as a first year resident, saw um, internal incongruities and inconsistencies. 
uh, and I questioned it. Um, Carl Jung uh, famously said that our children live out our, uh, I think our unfulfilled fantasies or something. This is a, my younger daughter's first vehicle. And uh, first of all, you see the shape of the vehicle that was her first vehicle. But um, this is the bumper sticker she rode around on. And um, it, I could have put that on my car. These ideas evolved um, in a very <laughs> struggled way. According to Greek mythology, the, the legend has that Athena, the goddess of, of wisdom and logic, sprang fully formed from her father Zeus's head. And I take that as a metaphor for a hypothesis fully formed at conception. These ideas were not that. Think of Sisyphus. This was built brick by brick. And every time I took two steps forward, I, I felt like I rolled back an equal amount. But that said, I'll present the ideas to you. Starting with presentation, that's the proper place to start. When a patient comes in with intermittent exotropia, you need to determine two a lot of things, but two things right off the bat, you need to pay attention to their control and the angle. And they're different, of course, you all know that. The control tells you if you should treat. The angle tells you once you've decided to treat, how much you should do and what you should do. So in other words, a large angle with good control, you don't have to treat. Some patients, not many, may go their whole life with a large angle, well-controlled deviation. Whereas a small angle with poor control, you probably should treat. So you need to develop a control score. And there are various ones published. And I, I personally don't have a vested interest in one control score over another. But I'll tell you what my own personal bias is to have a, a two-phase control score. Every patient gets two categories. Uh, two scale uh, scores. One is I scale how easily they break fusion and a second for how quickly they recover. Because there are some patients that break control easily, but recover quickly. And there's some that you may have to really work to break fusion, but they have poor recovery. And I like to look at them. They don't always go hand in hand. And the problem I have with the published control scores is they conflate them. Like they'll say, uh, you know, uh, breaks easily and recovers quickly. Well, they don't, don't allow for breaks easily and doesn't recover. Uh, so, or whatever. So um, that's just my personal bias. Now, as far as intervention and when to intervene, there's multiple studies show a high incidence of post-operative developing or showing monofixation if surgery is done at a young age. And I'm, I'm talking hmm, ballpark under three years of age. It's not clear if that's because the initial desired overcorrection we get, we like our XTs to be overcorrected. In a very young patient, you know, a one-year-old who's 10 ET for just a week or two, a couple of weeks, might lose bifofial fusion. So is it because very young patients can't be ET very long? after surgery, or is it a pre-existing selection bias? Is it the patient with poor fusion that comes in needing uh, with poor control at a younger age? And it's a hard thing to sort out because we can't test a one-year-old for monofixation very easily, at least sensorially. So I take the approach that I temporize if I can. Uh, if I can't, and we'll talk about temporizing in a minute, if I can't and I have to operate in a very young child, I avoid a longstanding ET postoperatively. So at one week, if they're still ET, I'll intervene with either Fresnel prisms, alternate patching, maybe phospholine iodide if it's available. I don't want them to be esotropic very long. Now, the indication for intervention um, if 
classic. If the patient is tropic greater than 50% of the time, that's our cue to intervene. Of course, it's very hard to determine. Parents, we, we go by what parents say. And you know, if they see the eye go out and then many times a day, they may be more apt to notice it than the eye that goes out and stays out for a long time. But that's our general guideline. I'll also intervene if it's clear that control is worsening. And I may intervene in some form uh, if there's diplopia or asthenopia. Now, my initial intervention with a young child presenting with intermittent NXT is almost always to start a program of alternate patching. And I'll patch three or four hours a day for anti-suppression. And the fixation pattern determines how I do this. If there's a free equal vision alternator, and I will say, in my experience, intermittent extropia, it's rare for them to freely alternate, but they do. Uh, I'll go one, one alternate eye, alternate day. If there's a fixation preference, I'll go two and one, three and one, depending on uh, how strong the fixation preference is with the greater number over the dominant eye. Now, what's interesting is this almost always improves both the angle and the control. I'm not surprised anti-suppression improves control because improved diplopia awareness helps the patient fuse. I do not know why it decreases the angle, but it almost always does. When I see them after a month of this program, they are almost always better. And then I'll, I'll either, depending on how much better, I'll either continue it or, or start weaning them and I'll cut the patching in half and then I'll go to maybe alternate days. Uh, and I'll gradually get them off patching. Often, sometimes that's curative, but often it recurs. And if it recurs, I'll repeat the program, I'll reinstitute it, and I'll introduce over minus. And I over minus by two diopters and incorporate two to three basin prism in each lens. Now, I've been doing this for years, and I know the recent study from PEDIG suggested that over minus causes uh, progressive myopia. I actually looked at my own patients retrospectively with this and did not find that to be the case. And I won't go into the details of that study now, possibly because PDIG over minus by three and I over minus less, realized with the think of a normal ACA ratio, two to three basin prism in each lens, that's five or six uh, of prism, uh, is equivalent to one diopter of over minus with respect to uh, how much control you can gain over the deviation. And if I do over minus them, I always wean them out of it by the end of teenage years. If they're still needing it by then, uh, I'll operate on them. And this bides time, often several years, uh, which is good because it allows them to be fusing longer, uh, allows you to get better measurements if you were dealing with a very young patient initially. And on occasion, not as often as I'd like, but on occasion, uh, this is a uh, curative. Now, if surgery is indicated, all patients get, in my practice, get a one hour patch test for the maximum angle at distance. This isn't just to address the near. And all of them have a measurement looking at an outside target. They take them to a window or outdoors, have them look at a flagpole or a stop sign. And interestingly, you know, many patients will increase their distance angle with a patch. Many will increase looking at a far outdoor target. Uh, and different patients will increase with different mechanisms. So you really uh, have to do both. And you need to operate for the maximum angle. Now, if you, if you can't take the patient outdoors, you can take them to a window. And this is to depict the fact that the distance from the window is important. Here's a schematic eye, X distance from this window. And in this drawing, the window subtends 70 degrees on the retina. So 70 degrees of the retina is receiving outdoor illumination. If I double the distance from the window, I'm only subtending 30 degrees on the retina. So if you want to maximize the increased light exposure, um, you want them as close to the window as they can be, still allowing room for you to be in front of them with your prism and 
cover test equipment uh, to get your measurement. So the patients that increase when they look at a far out or distant target, I refer to them as having outdoor sensitivity, for lack of a better term. And I was interested in, is it the increased light or the distance that causes the bigger deviation? And it turns out it's both. I looked at 76 patients that showed outdoor sensitivity, and I measured them with indoor lighting in a very long corridor, 24 meters. And I measured them at the standard six meter distance under floodlights simulating um, outdoor illumination. And interestingly, some increased when I measured them in the long hallway, but not with the floodlights. Some increased with the floodlights, but not in the hallway. Some increased with both and some with neither. So you really need to do both and you need to measure them on an outdoor distant target. Now I wanna talk about something that's, I think, very important to my understanding of intermittent extropia. And it's something that um, I now call the SCOBY phenomenon. I originally called it tenacious proximal fusion and I'll explain why. Here's a very typical patient. They're 30 at distance and ortho at near. As SCOBY described, if you patch them monocularly for an hour and remeasure them, many of them, the majority, will increase the near deviation. This is the simulated divergence excess, pseudo divergence excess. Um, <clears throat> I initially referred to this as tenacious proximal fusion, and I don't like that term because. They don't actually, be, I, I thought of it, it's as though they, they have this fusion that is tenacious, it doesn't let go with a simple patch. But turns out they don't have to be fusing to manifest it. If I take this patient 30 distance ortho at near, and I just hold up an occluder and have them look at a near target and uncover, they'll be ortho. They never had a chance to fuse. Yet, if I patch them for an hour, the deviation comes out. So I got away from that term. And for lack of a better term, I just thought I'd credit the genius who came up with it, and I call it the SCOBY phenomenon. But what's important to know about the SCOBY phenomenon is it's, a, it's beneficial. It foretells a better prognosis. It's a stronger, I'll say, fusional mechanism, despite what I just said, uh, that helps you. So distance near differences, aliburia, a divergence excess. Well, I would submit that this is not caused by an excess of divergence. And there's a lot of data, if people want, I can talk about it during questions, uh, why it's not an excess of divergence. I think of this as an exotropia with an excess of some type of near convergence, be it fusional, accommodative, SCOBY phenomenon, something else. The basic is basic. I don't have a better term for that. And convergence insufficiency, we're going to talk about that separately. And the pseudo divergence excess is the SCOBY phenomenon. Now, I think it's important to realize that plus three lenses and monocular occlusion are not the same. One suspends fusional convergence and the other accommodative convergence. Yet, both may diagnose the pseudo-divergent yeah. success. And it's um, not, it's immediately graspable why that is. See if I can explain it. First, an important point. ACA ratios in intermittent extropia can be calculated in all the usual ways provided, and notice that's bold face capped and a different color, provided that any near measurement is made after the contaminating effect of TPF is eliminated by a one hour patch test. So uh, that's, that's absolutely key. So let's look at the, the issue of um, plus threes versus patching. Here's a patient, 30 distance ortho near. Now, I, I don't want to bother patching, so I, I use plus threes. And 
oh, the near deviation comes out, there, there are 30. Is this a high ACA? Well, if we just look at the numbers, you've got an ACA of 10. You have, you got 30 prism diopters by relaxing three diopters of accommodation. It's an ACA of 10. Probably this is not a high ACA. Here's why. You didn't eliminate the SCOBY phenomenon before you did that in your measurement. So this patient is 30 distance ortho at near and they're masking 30 at near due to the SCOBY phenomenon, but I haven't patched them. Now I hold up plus threes. Well, they still have accommodative convergence, even if it's normal, and that's going to relax, uh, get rid of about, oh, maybe 10 in this case of exotropia, uh, or add to 10 of exotropia. So here we see that plus threes gave us 10 prism diopters over the after patch measurement. It's an ACA of 3.3. It's a normal ACA. So this is, this is why plus threes will unmask many pseudodivergence excess. This is a pseudo high ACA ratio. And it's important to recognize that and differentiate it from the rare patient, and they're rare, I think I've seen about 20 of these in my career, that is an intermittent extropia with a true high ACA ratio. And what do we mean by that? Well, the distance is greater than near. It's accommodative convergence in this case. So they do not increase it near with a patch. They do increase it near with plus significantly with plus three lenses after a patch. By increase, I mean big deviation comes out. In these patients, if we do a distance gradient ACA, it's high. And if we measure them very close, like three inches, which is closer than how we, we usually uh, measure, we see an esophoria, not an exophoria. You know, the normal patient and the normal intermittent exo, when you come in real close, you exceed the near point of convergence and they break and go exo. Now it's important to recognize these because in my experience, if you operate for that distance angle and if you correct it, 100% of them will have an esotropia near after surgery and either need a bifocal or further surgery. And that statement can be made as it having 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity these criteria for predicting a post-operative DET. So once I recognize this, I don't operate on them right away. What do I do? Well, because they have a high ACA, over minus works great. You get a lot of bang for your buck. A small amount of minus lens corrects a lot of deviation. You can over minus them, but you will need to put them in a bifocal. And the ACA in all cases that I followed normalizes by the end of teenage years. And then you can operate them on, on them in the usual manner and you get the usual result. I've been asked about the role of prism adaptation and uh, for unmasking your deviations. Classic prism adaptation, you know, you put on Fresnels and send them home, has not been rigorously studied by me. Um, I think it's worthy of a prospective study. But I did do and published what I called a rapid prism adaptation. I have that patient, they're 30 and ortho, sit them in a chair with a trial frame, put 30 base in in both eyes, just have them read a, uh, between the two eyes, have them read a paragraph, and in just a matter of 30 seconds, cover test. And that'll bring out the near deviation in many patients with the SCOBY phenomenon. I find that it is qualitatively the same as a patch test, but it's quantitatively different. And I think if someone's eager for a project, I think that's a great thing to study. So back to surgical recommendations. Burian's recommendations are based on a false assumption. They're based on the assumption that lateral rectus recessions affects the distance more than the near. And then an R&R &R affects the distance and near equally. And I 
mentioned Steve Archer's name. I think he did a very nice study that adequately, in my mind at least, disproves these false, these shows these assumptions to be false. My thoughts. Divergence excess is probably masking the newer deviation that we still haven't brought out. With longer patching, with prism adaptation to it, I don't know. But studies at my own personal clinical trials show you can do lateral recessions, you can do R&Rs, your preference. If you have a bias for one or the other, your preference. Basic. The basic is missing the SCOBY phenomenon. So they have a poor prognosis. You need to do a stronger procedure. And I found that an r, &R does better than standard lateral recessions. But study from Korea showed that if you enhance your recession formula in these patients, add a millimeter and a half or two to each recession, you can get as good results with lateral recessions as an r, &R. Again, it has nothing to do with the distance near difference. Uh, it has to do with the fact they don't have the SCOBY phenomenon. And the pseudo-divergence excess, the SCOBY phenomenon, is present by definition. Dealer's choice, lateral recessions, r, &R or medial resections, um, you could do whichever you want. Convergence insufficiency. You know, I don't know why others haven't picked up on this. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. But I think we use the term convergence insufficiency to describe two distinctly different clinical, well, they're related, two different clinical conditions. There's the fusional convergence insufficiency. That's the patient that has a trivial distance phoria, a bigger near phoria, rarely tropic, but a bigger phoria, low fusional convergence amplitudes, and they do well with exercises. All the orthoptists in the group know how to treat those patients. But then there's a patient that if you drill down, you'll see is an accommodative convergence insufficiency. They have atropia, an intermittent tropia, small at distance, larger at near. They may have normal accommodative amplitudes, accommodative amplitudes, but if you measure their ACA with a gradient method, distance and or near, it's very, very low. I've had some patients that had zero for an ACA ratio. These patients don't have accommodative convergence and that's why they do so poorly. Now, there are any surgical options difficult. You can resect medials, you can recess laterals, you can do an R&R. &R. I think to target the distance deviation because nothing's gonna give them a normal ACA ratio in my mind and then deal with the residual near deviation uh, with optical means or whatever. But I'd like to introduce what I call the Buckley procedure. And this is what I was doing uh, after he described it. Ed Buckley described in these adult patients in presbyopes to move the muscles you operate, either move the medials up or the laterals down whether you're doing medial resections or lateral recessions or an R&R, to induce a V pattern when there wasn't one there before. And that'll help in the down gaze reading position. And uh, I have found consistently either laterals down or medials up uh, will give about uh, roughly eight, nine prism diopters of V. Uh, and I think that's a useful adjunct for this group of patients. Finally, I think it's finally, I want to talk about lateral incompetence. And, you know, this was described by Sally Moore and Phil Knapp uh, back in the 50s, that some patients with intermittent exotropia markedly decrease their deviation if they look in both right and left gaze. And by markedly, some articles said 15 prism diopters, some said 10, some said 50%. But the important thing, it decreases in both directions. There's a high incidence of overcorrection in primary, according to them, uh, if you do standard surgery. Now, some people feel this condition is an artifact of measuring. I feel it exists, but not as commonly as Moore and Knapp described. But if you look at this, do you think, what could be causing this mechanically? Well, 
Weak laterals would cause a decrease in right and left gaze, but it's hard to fathom, in my mind, weak laterals in a patient that has intermittent extropia. Overacting medials will cause it, and I think that's what's going on, because that'll explain why they're prone to overcorrection. If you weaken the laterals, and now the overly strong medials are unopposed, less opposed, patient goes ET. But no one's talked about this. What if you see this pattern after prior lateral recessions? Very common. Patient had laterals done, it recurs. 30 primary, 15 right and left gaze. Now the laterals are iatrogenically weakened. This is a different mechanism than the de novo strong medials. These patients are not prone to overcorrection in the primary position but they may be overcorrected in side gaze if the deviation small, and you have to take that into account. And finally, surgical goal. I like an immediate overcorrection of five to 15 prism diopters in children and young adults, but I do not overcorrect adults with intermittent extropia. I like to do adjustable sutures. I like to do symmetric surgery. I aim for ortho and primary just bordering on diplopia a little bit to the right or left, because I find adults don't straighten the way the younger patients do. And I, I think I'm an outlier in that. So in summary, we talked about when to operate, conservative management, surgical measurements, distance near differences. We talked about the different types of convergence and sufficiency, how to recognize the true high ACA and the surgical goal. And with that, I again, thank you. And I think we're pretty much on time, at least with the length of the talk. And we can take questions if you like. Yes, thank you again, Dr. Kushner. A great talk. Uh, great to see all that wisdom over all those years of, of research and experience there. So uh, any questions from the floor? I see Dr. Rubab. That was a great talk, Dr. Kushner. Thank you. My question is regarding control. So sometimes in clinical, we observe better control what parents or the patients, especially if they are teenagers, they themselves see. So how you like how you consider it when you are deciding about surgery? It's going to be purely your observation or orthopic observation as compared to what patients see, and sometimes they will kind of push you for surgery. So I, I want to be sure I understand the question because the voice cut out a little bit. You're asking how when the, the child's older and they're not in, under the eye of their parents, how we assess control? Yeah, like if parents or the patient, they, they say it's worse, that's really bad, and it should be operated, and you should do something about it, versus you see a good control in clinic. Well, that, that there's no straightforward answer and you have to in, individualize it. I, I think that um, the one thing that comes to mind is I do have some patients that um, have very poor control outdoors. And in my standard 20 foot exam lane with normal illumination have much better control. What perplexes me the most is the patient that has not just better control, but a very small angle. I remember one patient who I never could get more than five prism diopters in the office, maybe 10, it was a long time ago, but take her outdoors and she's 35. And I, you know, I'll pay attention to that. But the, the, the patients are the ones who live with the problem. I, you know, I, I pay attention. I mean, you, you have to assess your patient. Is it an intelligent patient? Are they, do they seem reliable? Are they, you know, the patients that are completely unreliable and you, you don't think you can do that. So there's no one answer, but perhaps an answer is there are certainly circumstances where I will let patient observation and or parent observation trump what I take priority, I can't say the word trump, take priority over um, what I observe in the clinic if I think that they're if I think they're reliable. 